Hello and welcome back to Speed Demon Painting. The long-awaited 3.04 Orbat update is finally here, and this first video in a series that I'll be doing is all about the changes to general rules that are going to affect almost every faction, pretty much like I did last time. The idea is to still make some separate videos about what has been buffed and what has been nerfed for every faction specifically, but that is not the intent for this specific video. If you do want to see the video that affects your faction specifically, I suggest you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel to watch that future video coming somewhere this week. One of the type of videos that I'm also known for are the Orbat Deep Dives, but I'm not getting into those straight away, mostly because this is the first time that they've launched them in a sort of beta form, where uh, you can actually playtest all of these things for about a month, send in all the feedback that you want, and then the final Orbats will be finalized and will then sort of proceed to be used for the next six months. Um, that is a lot longer than people were <laughs> used to in the past, and uh, it also caused a bit of gnashing of teeth every now and then, especially on the Discord channel, but uh, here we are, they are finally here and hopefully they'll be nice and stable for people to use in the coming six months. And just what are those big changes? Well, as number one, I have the fact that patrons are now added. Patrons were a thing that was mentioned in the last uh, campaign set, but didn't quite have their rules yet, as they would have to come in the Orbats, but they are now added. And what is a patron? Well, it's a patron is selected when you build a force. You can say that it is being paid for by a certain noteworthy individual within your factions. This patron actually costs you some VP, uh, meaning your opponent gains a number of VP at the start of the game, depending on the patron cost. And I've added an example here in the top right corner for Anna von Malberg, who is a Prussian commander, the Teutonic Grand Master. If you take her, your opponent will immediately start the game with three extra victory points without even having to lift a finger. But it's a pretty big bonus that your force is going to be getting, because when a unit in this force of mass 3 or less enters play using the unexpected arrival rule, models in that unit may fire their weapon at the full battle-ready profile instead of the cripple profile. It's a pretty big thing, but yeah, it does cost you 3 victory points. Models in the for force uh, using the veteran Voltmeister rule also get 2 extra dice rather than plus 1 to their assault action dice. Isn't doesn't just end with that unexpected arrival thing, it's uh, quite a bit stronger even uh, when you think about it. And so every single faction has their own patrons now. I suggest you check out your Orbat to see what yours can do, because they do unlock quite a bit of cool little combos that you can uh, find in your own force, and uh, even lets you alter the selection of your force. Uh, for example, uh, there are full mercenary fleets now, as an option, uh, through this patron system. Although there is a be advised kind of uh, warning that goes along with that. A lot of these mercenary factions fight really, really well when you're ahead in victory points. Uh, quite a lot of their rules only apply then, and uh, so selecting one of these forces and then already being on the back foot when it comes to victory points means that you're really going to have to sort of give them a little boost of confidence on the battlefield uh, to really make the most out of them. But it is very cool that mercenaries are now more of a thing through that patron system. And also, as a general thing, uh, speaking of, all the mercenary fleets are now fleshed out, so I'm guessing that's going to be a big new push coming in the future uh, for Dystopian Wars. Number two, I did not leave this slide in from my last video. Heavy firepower has been tweaked again. Uh, it is no longer activated for the entire unit, because that sometimes caused a few weird rules interactions, but if for each individual models. You still have to do it before you start attacking and everything, before you declare your attacks. But now only a single unit, or sorry, a single model may use three lead weapon values. Others can support, but cannot benefit from using their lead value uh, instead, so there's a little less min-maxing that way, especially through things like attached units. There were a couple of combinations in the past that were a bit too strong. And um, it definitely tones down heavy firepower for units that had it, units of cruisers. They could also get to kind of ridiculous numbers of dice, so I kind of agree with the nerf that uh, it is now slightly less. Um, but those units that did have it now often have bespoke rules, such as crossed beams for the Enlightened, or heavy bombardment for the Augustus uh, cruiser bombards as well. And uh, so yeah, that's a good thing. They still have them if it was really an iconic thing for the unit. However, other units like the Charlemagne do still have heavy, fi heavy firepower, but it's just 
slightly less effective than it was before. Another big thing that was really, really strong in the past was strategic reserves. Now, this is a battle fleet bonus that some battle fleets could get, and it was so strong that quite a lot of people just built their entire force around it, which was perhaps a bit much for just a battle fleet bonus. Now, don't get me wrong, it is still hyper, hyper efficient. Um, you still have to place your entire fleet in reserves, or not at all, so that hasn't changed. You still have to roll for the reserves, so that hasn't changed, but you can now cancel it for the heavy hit as per usual. However, the difference is in the following two bullet points. If you did pass your reserve roll naturally through your dice roll, they just enter reserves as normal, as described in the main rulebook, and thus can fire at full efficiency. However, if you needed to cancel the result and apply the heavy hit, you can fire and ram, but just at crippled values this turn. Meaning your strategic reserves are still incredibly reliable to come in, but if the luck isn't exactly on your side, you're going to have to fire at slightly less efficiency than before. It's still a very strong tactic, don't get me wrong, but it was perhaps a bit too reliable in its old iteration, and that is a bit more of a bad luck protection, yeah, but not so much as strong as it was before, overall. At number four, there's submarauder changes again. Um, it was personally a bit of feedback that I actually sent, uh, because I love the new Submarauder rule, I love the fact that they activated first, however, in the old version you still had to roll for your, uh, uh, for your reserve roll at the end of the activation, like you normally would. And in those few games that we've played where I've been using Submarauders, and I roll that lucky exploding 6 in turn 1, that exploding hit, uh, that unit came on and absolutely trashed one thing on the other side, swinging the favour of the battle so much in favour of the person using the Submarauder, that was probably just a bit much. One lucky uh, uh, exploding hit could just completely affect uh, the whole turnout of the game. It was a bit much. And, um, despite being big models, they could strike anywhere on the board, so there was no way that your opponent could even sort of outwit you in a way, and moving away from them if he saw it coming. So that is also slightly tweaked now through the use of a Submarauder token. These Submarauders still have to activate first, even on turn 1, but the only thing that they do on turn 1 is to place a Submarauder token somewhere on the battlefield, and starting from turn 2 and upwards, they still have to activate first, but they can only be deployed within 10 inch of one of those Submarauder tokens, or a rec marker if one is available in the mission, because those rec markers can also sort of hide and mask where they're going to strike as well. This means that there's some pretty big repercussions for using uh, submarauders in your force, uh, because well, we all know that the opening salvo in this game can be quite significant and uh, can basically put a force on the back foot in turn one, if uh, especially if it's a very uh, effective alpha strike. Usually your submarauders can make up for it, because starting from turn two, if you had any submarauders, usually you were the one alpha striking. And now, because they have to place that single token, it means you're giving up a very important activation in the game to do so. So, it's just, you cannot really design a force now that has a lot of, let's call it, beta strike potential through submarauders in the second turn, and still have a bunch of units with a lot of alpha striking potential. Usually those are the ones that don't really stand up to any punishment from the opponent. And so if you create a force that has both, you're going to have to pick and choose. I mean, somebody is going to be able to throw spanners into work if you're doing that one. On top of that, submarauders can also be blocked by a navigation lockdown, so there's no deep diving again after you've uh, uh, done your thing at the start of the turn if you've suffered a navigation lock throughout uh, that whole turn. And another small thing, these things now actually use a submerged slot during the list building phase, but then change their position trait as they come up to become a surface unit, meaning that they are uh, not extra protected or anything like that when you find them in the submerged slot. That actually changes as the battle goes along. Overall, a bit more polishing for this uh, cool rule. Uh, killer robots and uh, squids and everything need to be strong in the game, uh, but uh, it's a bit much when you stack them with a lot of units that have insane alpha strike potential, and that really does tone this particular thing down. 
Another thing that you may have noticed when reading up on all the generic roles in your faction, speaking of, they are now neatly bundled together in the first five pages, uh, regardless of what it is, uh, in uh, your first five roles for the faction, uh, is that you will see a lot of blue text cleaning up some wordage. Many rules now are per model basis rather than per unit, um, so a lot of the changes are tied to certain models rather than units. This largely cuts back on any shenanigans that you can do by attaching unit to parent units with very strong rules and therefore conferring them onto attached units as well. Um, that's definitely being toned down as well. Uh, things like focused gunnery aren't automatically going to be transferred to any attached units uh, the way the w r r rules are written now and uh, you know, that might be deliberate uh, because suddenly your units can go up a lot in efficiency when, uh, when they're just paired with the right parent unit. Another big change are to those weird and wonderful uh, tokens that are now in the game. Um, if these tokens perform SRS style attack runs, they are mostly SRS for other roles too. Um, and by that I mean things like flak barrage, you can shoot them down. Things like ma uh, magnetic generators, more on which later, but they can also target these types of tokens. But there's also upsides to it, because you can use those special tokens now as uh, spotter rules, for instance, or for the spotter rule, I should say, and for a fog of war to actually take away uh, the limited visibility and report back to your main ships where the position of the enemy is. And if these tokens assault, they are now actually assault tokens. They do not provide benefits to rules like spotter and everything, but they will actually perform a dedicated assault now with a different timing than before. The timing has now changed to uh, uh, during the SRS resolution, but before the SRS themselves attack. So um, it's no longer this sort of instant strike within 20 inch that it was before. Uh, there's a bit of response time for your opponent uh, to uh, engage with these uh, special assault tokens as well. Now, to um, have an example for this, I've included two of them. One of them is the Exo subs from um, the Empire. Um, they usually have two numbers associated with them, one of them being the battle-ready capacity, the other one being the crippled capacity uh, are mentioned there. Each model in this unit may place an indicated number of Exo sub SRS tokens up to 40 inch from this model in based contact with an enemy model, so they can only be used that's a special thing, on enemy models, not on friendlies, so don't expect them to be used in defense. One example of where they are different from normal SRS tokens. Exosub SRS tokens are a type of SRS tokens, so all of the things apply, like I said, and have a choice of an attack profile presenting whether they attack from above or below the target. Declare when you are making the attack run of all of your S um, Exosub SRS tokens all at once. Uh, they must all make the attack run in the same way. They gain 5 dice per token with either homing, devastating and submerged quality or 5 dice, by the way submerged means that your opponent can still use the submerged defense, or they can forego the submerged defense and make an attack with 5 action dice with homing and piercing qualities. So quite a bit different and your opponent won't get to defend against those. You resolve the attack runs by exosub before other attack run targets, but that means after assault tokens. Four successes are required to successfully intercept an exosub SRS token, so that's also a deviation from the standard rule mentioned specifically for these, and exosub SRS tokens cannot be targeted with the flak barrage rule, but they can be with the magnetic, right? because that's the general rule. An example of an assault token now is the pacifier assault. Um, it can be used instead of making a normal assault, so no double dipping there, and uh, you still place a number of tokens up to 20 inch away equal to the mass of the target. These are now assault tokens, and they happen at the beginning of the end phase, but before SRS resolution. Each talent makes an, uh, an assault, or well, each talent token contributes 5 action dice to an assault uh, against the initial target, and uh, they can form a single stack when doing so. So if you've got multiple ships launching them, they all just perform one coordinated attack with that specific target, and they just ignore counter-assaults, because you're not counter-assaulting the ship, you're counter-assaulting against a very specific set of marines or whatever they are being sent out. 
Friendly SRS placed in contact with the initial target may support the auto gyron token stack in the assault, so you can still use the bonus from SRS in assault as well with them. And uh, at the end of the assault of that phase, they are just discarded, so they're all gone. Two such examples, there are many more like them, but yeah, you will see where they differ from normal attacks. It's all described there, and uh, pay close attention to it, because uh, there are some uh, meaningful differences in some cases. And, as I've mentioned in the previous section, change number 7 is a change to magnetic generators. They still protect against aerial and SRS attacks like they did before, by uh, making your opponent reroll their uh, heavy hits, uh, so double-edged sword might end up as exploding hits, could be worse, but that hasn't changed. But they can now target three types of tokens. The SRS tokens, before mentioned, almost everything is classed as either an SRS token, an assault token, or, and this is new, escort tokens. So you can actually uh, do away with some of those pesky little escorts from your opponent in different ways using magnetic generators as well. So they've become even more useful, generally speaking, than before. And uh, if you're completely uh, defenseless against SRS attacks, you really only have yourself to blame because you're now equipped with quite a lot of tools that can intervent, uh, intervene with these things uh, through flag barrage and these new mag magnetic generators. Uh, it's something you're going to have to take into account when building a list. And then one rule that personally has me excited, um, because quite a lot during my deep dives I had to say like, okay, well you've got this small unit of two mass one things that you can attach to some ship, but I advise against it because you're basically giving away a free squadron killer bonus to your opponent when you do so. That has been changed some of them, not all of them, of the mass ones now have acceptable attrition, meaning um, you're pretty much guaranteed not to give away some free victory points to your opponent, uh, who doesn't really have to do a lot of effort to wipe those away. Um, and it's a much better representation for some nations who use some of their mass one uh, ships as completely disposable and not really worth anything as well. The rule it says says that if it uh, is four models or less at the start of the encounter, destroying this unit does not confer a squadron killer victory point bonus. Nice and simple, but a nice problem that was solved this way, and something that was more of a limit in list building in my book. And then a big deal that is more of a meme than anything else, but there has been a solid buff to Inspirational. Inspirational now reduces disorder to all friendly units within 10 inch, which is good, and it now allows for a single action dice to be rerolled in every phase of that model's activation. So maybe, with a bit of luck, you might actually remember that a unit has this rule now. And there we go, that's the recap of the biggest changes to me. Will I be doing deep dives? Yes, but like I say, after the uh, Orbats have left their beta stage, because if people find these videos and I have to redo all of them, they are a fair amount of work after all, um, it's going to be only good for a month, so I'm waiting for that uh, time period to come out. Um, as a few side notes, we have way more stable Orbats now. At the beginning of the channel I was constantly doing updates about new updated rule and uh, that is no longer the case uh, which makes these uh, deep dives way more valuable as well. Um, I actually think that's quite good as well. There are quite a few people complaining about printing out an Orbat and then, you know, life gets in the way, you can't play for a couple of weeks, maybe even a month, because, you know, for a lot of adults that's just reality, and then you find out that you're gonna have to reprint stuff again. I mean, that's not a good thing. Um, printers don't, don't run cheap uh, for those people who have them. Uh, they don't often work, uh, but that's a whole different thing. Uh, and it's not quite fun if you have to do that, so stability is a good thing. Um, however, we've also seen the major downside of that rule stability, and I hope that one can be slightly tweaked in the future, but we'll see. Uh, there were a few frustrating units, such as the, the new Grail and the Sakas for the Crown, for instance. The models have been out in the wild because the Spruce got updated, but didn't have any rules. So that must have been quite frustrating for those players, and I can actually see how that new stability um, can cause a few issues uh, here and there, if the planning isn't always going as well. The general advice is be selective with what you print, I suppose. Uh, these are going to be good for a month. You can print them out, but 
realize that you might have to print them again in the near future. It's all up to you really, if you really like playing with physical copy next to you, go for it. I mean, at least it's quite well communicated now for just how long this will be valid. What you can expect from the channel though, like I said at the start, is doing a slightly simplified sort of stonks up or down video for all of the unit entries, uh, so you can still have a bit of extra information for your specific faction. And if that is something you're looking forward to, again, make sure you subscribe to the channel to catch those future updates. The weather here in Western Europe is absolute garbage right now, so I do have a bit more time to do that, because otherwise I'd be spending my time doing useless stuff such as gardening and everything, so... Um, that's not the case. I do hope to see you again for the next videos and uh, see you then. Bye!